Are you staying there, are you? Oh, <laughs> yes. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to briefly run through um, what we've been up to with the Doctor Monument piece. Um, with the particular focus on our outreach projects, which I guess in many ways takes Tom's middle way approach to projects. Um, I'll just briefly take you through um, our day job and then um, Carol will um, launch into some of that stuff. But basically the, the, the main idea is to focus on the impact of our archaeology has on people and the, the impact people can have on archaeology. Um, in particular with non-traditional groups, groups that we don't normally um, or don't easily work with, I should say. So, okay. <laughs> sounds good to good start. Um, so, basically, Adopter Money, for those who don't know, is a conservation access um, and interpretation project. These are projects that are community led. Um, community groups come to us um, with a site in mind. We help them secure the funding or necessary skills to, as I say, manage the vegetation to proper interpretation if that's what they need to do, historical research, and um, make it accessible to the public, whether that's putting in, sometimes it goes all the way up to paths, sometimes it's just about promoting a site. Um, <clears throat> currently, we're doing 40 of these projects. The project, the scheme itself has been running since 1993, supported originally from Stock Scotland. Um, currently, we're funded by HLF, Stock Scotland, and um, Highland and Argyll um, leader programs. So, what we've been up to over the last two years, this is the existing projects, is working with uh, 20 projects across Scotland. So we have projects on the island, we have projects in the central belt, we have projects everywhere basically. Um, and we've also been working with 15 non-traditional groups, um, from homeless groups um, to vulnerable women to young people with them um, being uh, underemployed, I think is the technical term. But, um, yeah. We provide training, we provide resources, and we provide um, transferable skills, I guess is what you do. But the, again, as I said, the, the idea is to have an impact on the archaeological record, but also try to address real life problems. So the, the, the aim of these projects is to work with groups and use to try and focus on archaeology as relevant to the real world, or to the modern world, I should say. So we're addressing problems like skills gaps, we're addressing problems like confidence, but also addressing the needs of the archaeological record. Um, the idea basically came from one of my bosses at Oxford Archaeology, um, Austin Ainsworth, who was doing this project down in Gloucester. He was working with homeless groups um, and um, groups with learning difficulties. And just talking to him about these ideas and how we might be able to progress this up in Scotland, we had some great feedback from our funders, from Lakes Life in particular, and from South Scotland about how we weren't ticking boxes. This is not about um, gathering numbers, saying we, we um, engage all of the public and then fill in the funding report and say, look how successful we are. This is actually about addressing issues that point out to us. So many of these projects are based on ideas raised from local forty archaeologists and from the partner organisation. So we generally work in partnership with a charity who have an idea, that, whether it's about socialising, whether it's about skills training. So we've done a few partnership projects that are kind of relevant, but are slightly aside from this. So we work currently with the Scottish Waterways Trust um, and Scottish Canals on a project called Canal College, where we're working with underemployed young people from Falkirk, and it's about providing transferable skills for the job market. So they we only do one aspect of it, they do many things, they do vegetation management, they do dry stone walling. But the, the idea is that we at the end of their programme, eight week programme I think it is, we do six days of that. They have a series of case studies to they can provide to a, 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 an employer, they can put on a CV, those kinds of things. And like examples of work they've done and evidence to show that that's what it is. So that those are the that's a bare bone of what we've been up to, um, of where, where the idea comes from. The idea is about, as I say, archaeology for everyone. But Carl's going to see if you see some issues. Um, hello, again. Um, 
So yeah, we've been, as I said, we've been going for about two and a half years now, the current phase of Doctor Monument. Um, and in that time we've completed six outreach projects working with these sort of varied different audiences, non-traditional audiences. Um, our first project was Digging the Scene, which some of you in the audience have already seen um, her, um, presented in other uh, places. But this was um, a project with the Drop-In Centre, um, where we basically we did we introduced the concepts of recording the historic environment um, by recording ghost signs. So we're in Edinburgh Old Town here, um, and we went out and recorded go um, ghost signs there, um, or recorded fa um, faded commercial signage. And then we encourage them to research it, so go into their local library, go into the archive centre. We took them for a great visit around um, the Royal Commission's archives, and they're great to facilitate that. Um, so just giving, basically, um, offering an active engagement opportunity for people that never really got involved with um, things like this. Um, another project that we worked with, um, we've been working with the last two years, and we're going to work with um, them again, is a project called Dignity Connect. Um, this is actually an environmental project based in Dundee, and um, it's been going for about, I think, seven years, six years before we got there. Um, but Anne Molly, you can just see um, doing a star jump in the bottom photo there, she was constantly getting asked to do heritage activities, but it wasn't from her background, so she approached us to help provide heritage activities um, to go hand in hand with the Dignity Connect project. Um, and I brought up this project because it really changed the way we look at how we disseminate our results for some such projects, because Anne really encourages art-based dissemination, so things like, I mean, it's quite mental, but things like mosaics, things like um, artwork and things like that. Um, I know there's some I'm not like heritage people in the audience here, and I know you guys are doing that as well. But it was really valuable for us to work with Anne and the Dignity Connect project because it really it did challenge the way that we not only do these sorts of projects, but the way we spread our results afterwards. So Women at War, which is really the main case study we're going to present today, it was our sixth outreach project de developed. Um, and we worked with participants to record and research um, HMS Owl, Owl, or RAF Firm, and it's basically it's a World War II airfield in the Ross and Cromarty area. Um, it was built by the RAF in 1942, but very quickly taken over um, by the Navy, and that's when it became known as HMS Owl. And at its peak, there were 3,000 people um, serving on that site, but 400 of them were women. Um, and part, one of the projects we did want to do in our outreach project was to do a project working with underrepresented, underrepresented women, basically, perhaps um, you know not unemployed but maybe skilled, um, you know, so we can talk. Why don't we classically do a World War II project looking at the role of women who served there and try and marry it up with um, some modern um, themes? And when we were developing this project, we recognised early on. Um, the, the, the Rothschild Women's Aid, um, which is based in Dingwall, um, it's about an hour's drive from us, 45 minutes drive from the site, that they were perfectly placed, placed to be project partners in this project. Um, you know, they've already got that established audience um, with their women. Um, they offer um, short term assistance for women to leave abusive relationships by offering shelter and refuges, but they also offer long term support through organised support groups and activities. You know, they provide creative you know, workshops like creative writing or knitting, um, or even just general support groups where people get together and talk about their experiences. And Women at War um, came, became one of these groups. Um, the other reason Women's Aid was so great to work with is they'd actually already completed some gender studies work with the participants. So they were already getting them to discuss their ideas of gender identity and their day-to-day -day gender roles. So it actually married up very well with some of the um, research questions we had about HMSL. Um, and our project design was also influenced and informed by the Highland Council Historic Environment Team, um, who in 2011 had identified um, that it was an at-risk site. It's, um, it needed to have a baseline and survey completed of the site. Um, and also, no one had ever looked at the archival um, record of this site. No one had ever like, gone down to London and had a look at those sort of background records. So we took their sort of research questions. We took our sort of um, interest in working with this particular audience, and we created this, this project um, that, that we've actually we've just finished. 
So we were lucky enough um, to get additional funding from the HF All Our Stories Fund, um, which was a sort of community, it was, it was a slightly different fund if any of you, I don't know if anyone else in this audience um, received that fund, but it was a short-term fund, short-term funding, and the idea was to really sort of create active engagement opportunities in people's local heritage. And this additional funding really helped us provide transport, recept um, refreshments, equipment, not only laptops um, and tablets, but simple things like Wellingtons to go out on site, waterproofs, jumpers. These are things that people perhaps don't automatically think everyone has them, but different or these different order heritage audiences and they don't have them, you know. Um, the funding um, you know, the funding as I say allowed us to hire big cars. So I, I had one of those uh, minivans driving around the Ross and Prompty area. Um, so I could ferry our group from the Women's Aid office out to site, which I said was 45 minutes ago, and that actually came a quite a crucial um, element to the success of the project. Um, and the funding also allowed us to go down to London to visit the RAF Museum Archive, um, to visit the National Archives, and also to um, get in touch with the Imperial War Museum. Um, who had a diary of a Wren who had served that site. And that diary actually became the first sort of element of the first voice of the past that our participants came into contact with. Um, so over the course of the project, we delivered 18 workshops and our original budget with the Doctor Monument, we only really would have been able to deliver six and we certainly wouldn't have been able to have so many field trips out on site. Um, we had a mix of indoor workshops where we did background research, we looked at the archival material that I had collected, um, and then we also did the outdoor field work. And this sort of um, differing approach to this project actually allowed us to cater for all the different interests within the participants. Um, one of the highlights for the groups actually was um, the trip to the Highland Archive Centre. If any of you are up in the Highlands and you love archive centres, you should go there because it's awesome. Um, the staff there were really fantastic. Not only did they facilitate um, a guided tour around, um, you know, behind the scenes tour, so our participants got to see items being conserved and they got to go around the stores and things like that. And to you and I, that's quite a you know, we've, we've all done that, we've done that quite a lot. We have quite a lot of access to those sorts of places, but for our participants, it's the first time they'd ever got a chance to do that, and they could not believe that that, um, that the Archive Centre was free, it was open to anyone, anyone could go and do that. And I think one of them has since gone back and has now <laughs> enjoys sitting in there and doing research, which is brilliant. Um, so, as terms of what did we create from the project, we created traditional mediums, so things like a leaflet, um, we've got a soon-to-be-produced, I just need to get it printed, touring pop-up, we've got web content, so all of our results have gone on to um, designated web pages on the Archaeology Scotland website, um, I'm still enhancing them, so um, please bear with me. We've also produced a de data structure report, so again, very traditional ways of disseminating our results. Um, but we try to widen our reach not only with the web content but also as I said the type of dissemination of our results. So we've done things like poetry, which is quite a lot of way the wall to record our feelings about this site, but it actually worked very well um, and I'll come on to that. And we also did things like digital recording, like photogrammetry. Um, so what you know, what we kind of like what are the benefits of doing such a project like this? And I'm going to break it down to benefits for heritage, us, and the participant. And benefits for heritage are that we created a baseline record of a regionally important at-risk site. Um, there's a whole subculture of military enthusiasts out there, and um, joking aside, um, they, there's an amazing amount of books and websites that have typologised all of these buildings. Um, they, um, and so that allowed us to actually go out onto that site and properly identify what building was what, what was it used for, where we could. Um, we, we've got a photograph of pretty much um, within areas that are publicly accessible. We've got a photograph of every upstanding feature on that site. Um, and we've got a long secret area that we've recorded in depth to really show um, what you can, you, you know, the benefits, um, sorry, the, the how much data is still there within the site. Um, it allowed us, our field work allowed us to identify unknown aspects of well, on well-known features. So for example, an air raid shelter, I think that is on, 
Oh yes, actually that is according to mine, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, were, we found graffiti in air raid shelters that no one had ever found before. You know, someone from South Clapham had gone up to Fern and, and had written their name on there. Um, we identified previously unknown documents about the site, which really started to um, create a wider story of what the site, how important the site was at that time. Although it was only a training camp during the war, post war it was really, it was about to actually kick off and be a very important air base. Um, come and talk to me if you want to hear more about that. Um, and another highlight as well is that we recorded the oral history of the site. We identified a, a local wren in the area and we went and recorded her memories and her experiences of working out on the site. The benefits for us, we got to work with a fantastic group of participants who had a completely different idea and perception of heritage, and they fed their ideas into our work. Um, we kept the topics of the project quite loose, quite flexible, so we could adapt the project to what they were actually interested in. We developed this project. This project came, to be honest, out of my interest in World War II archaeology, but the actual data, you know, the topics that we did on each research came from them. And so we were able to move the project um, towards their interests. Um, we, began to, we were able to um, keep testing our methodologies of doing outreach work and we began to see on this project that our methodologies are working. But this is, I say, our sixth project and we can see that our general ideas, they, they're, they're working. This is, yeah, this, this appears to be a win, this project. Um, but we did recognise early on that we probably weren't going to complete a baseline survey of the site without professional support. So early on, because we've seen that with some of our previous projects, so early on we were able to make budget allocation to, um, make, um, to make allowance for in, um, getting um, more professional archaeologists out, out on the site and working side by side our women to record that site. Um, you can see how happy I am working on World War II archaeology. Um, the benefits participants. The project created a support group within Rothschild's Women's Aid, and this support group will continue because we're going back, we're going to do a second phase of our work. Um, it's interesting to note there were two workshops that I couldn't attend, and they, the women actually, while they were doing their work, they also used that as an opportunity to talk about elements of their past. So that's really interesting that they were using our heritage project as a, as a way to, to you know, talk about wider social issues. Um, by the end of the project, um, the group's perception of heritage and archaeology had completely turned on their heads. When we started, they had a very traditional view of what heritage was and what archaeology was. And then obviously I take them to this site and they can see how awesome corrugated iron and concrete is. Um, and it really, that, that was really interesting to see their journey throughout, across the site, their, their sort of changing in perceptions. It gave one participant who had been relocated to that area by Women's Aid the chance to explore her new countryside. It gave her, she would not have been able to get out there, she, you know, um, get, get out there by her side, by herself. So she was able to go out, explore, experience. Another participant said it was great because it got her out of the house each week. It was a different and positive thing to come out and do. Um, it also um, changed the way they looked at the landscape. We've said that about heritage, but landscape. And it also helped them develop new skills, new confidences. Here you've got a picture of a participant that at the start of the project refused to touch technology, refused to touch laptops, tablets, SLRs. And by the end of the project, she's like creating sort of um, photogrammetry models and also 3D panoramas of inside, inside of some of these structures. And the thrill of watching her do that and her sort of um, feelings afterwards. It was a really lovely positive experience to be able to change her perception of her mind. Um, <laughs> um, so if we just sort of really summarise the impact of women at war, um, we know that there are other people doing very interesting stuff. We've got Rachel Kiddy talking next door who does homeless archaeology. We're greatly influenced by her work. And also audiences, um, so organisations like Big Heritage in Liverpool, again, check them out on Twitter because they're really interesting um, what they're getting up to. In terms of the impact on heritage, the site is now recorded. We've got that baseline survey of that site that will go into the HER. And we've also got the um, investigation into the sort of background records um, and also the oral history, another really valuable data set that wouldn't have been found, wouldn't have been identified if our project hadn't been in place. The impact on us, what we're saying, we've really learned a lot of lessons with this project, but we've also begun to see that our methodologies of working with different audiences are working. I'm so pleased to meet you. Um, <laughs> and 
you know, while we applied our experiences, um, you know, by applying our experiences developed on other projects, we were able to create a really meaningful engagement project that will again go forward, as I say, as part of our phase two work with this group. And the impact on them, our participants. Um, you know, I have I've been quite believe that it has actually created a new heritage audience. These women had never done heritage before. They hadn't, you know, they've never really been interested in it, and now they want to go on and do phase two. And when they want to use that interest and that enthusiasm, and they want to widen the scheme um, to their other sort of support groups, and they want to use our women um, as sort of ambassadors for going out and doing further work like this. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.